Now, That's I understand that there's also some work being done on coal because coal is very plentiful, but yeah. it also burns very dirty. Yeah. And I think SRI is involved in this. Yeah. Something you do to process coal before you burn it, so when you do burn it, it burns a lot cleaner. Can you say anything about that in simple, non-technical terms? So, yes, that was uh, called an upgrading of coal. This was a technology that SRI developed many years ago, also about 30 years, maybe 25, 30 years ago. It's a K-fuel process for a particular client. This was taking a low-grade coal and upgrading it into a higher grade, removing the moisture, removing some of the other impurities. So how do you do that? By somehow compressing it or adding chemicals to it? A hot water treatment, basically. Mm -hmm. There are also um, actions that you can take around making it more environmentally benign, for example, by capturing that carbon dioxide that's yeah. an emission of concern. And we're doing a lot of work on campus right now, both uh, to help our um, co-developers uh, bring their technologies to market, or even companies that are simply looking for a place to help them scale up an idea that they have where we're not actually inventing the new technology ourselves, but applying our expertise in building systems and piloting technologies to help them bring it to market. The so big use of coal, if I may add, is, is for power generation, electricity generation. Mm -hmm. And the levelized cost of electricity, it's the cost that for producing power from coal, under the current market environment is the lowest. It's around two and a half to three cents a kilowatt hour. You get about five cents or so per kilowatt hour from nuclear. Wind can give you about six or seven. Uh, solar photovoltaics give you about cost about 30 35 cents speaking of nuclear um, does nuclear energy have a future a lot of people think that nuclear energy has no future no new nuclear power plants has been built in this country in decades yes, yes mm -hmm. true true all that is true but I think that this is one of the bridge technologies that we need and I, there are lots of good ways of using nuclear power also and it is uh, one of those non-CO2 emitting technologies that is at scale. There is a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding around nuclear. And that's one chapter that we devoted a lot in this book to talk about where are, what are the, of the different kinds of fears or misinformation about it, or what are the real technical challenges and what are the political challenges? Well, the recent earthquake in Japan, which, um, yeah. This, you know, destroyed the cooling system of the nuclear reactor. I mean, you, you have nuclear fuel, mm -hmm. which can't really be neutralized. You just have to lock it up somewhere. And, right, right. And nuclear waste, I mean, you don't want to just bury them in barrels and hope that nobody disturbs them for the next 25,000 years. Correct, correct. But there is, uh, I mean, there are ways to neutralize it also, by the way. There are some breeder technologies that could be developed. We haven't developed a whole lot of them, but there are being under, under development. Let's look at also the actual uh, casualties or so that nuclear energy has uh, resulted in. And then you see that its record isn't so bad. In Fukushima, let's not forget that more than 50,000 people, I think, died in the immediate um, result of the tsunami. How many have uh, died because of the nuclear accident? Well, not very many, but zero. But it wasn't the worst case. It wasn't the worst case. I agree. Look at the we can what ifs we can be certainly build and we have to look at. And this was an accident that was far, far outside the design range. Do you think that do you think that the urgency of developing new energy sources can get so great that sometimes we'll make errors of judgment? Yes. Uh, for example, there is a method of energy extraction called fracking in which you get oil and gas from under the earth. And what you do is you break rock layers to create more pathways for the oil and gas to be released. But mm -hmm. you're sort of breaking the earth to do it. Mm -hmm. um, is there a risk in that that might not be worth uh, the benefit? So that technology, again, uh, is, has been in practice for, more than, for a long time. And in most cases, it has been working well. Now, in the Marcellus region, where this has been most recently seen, we have seen some problems. And there are w things that need, we need to work on it, and we have to be vigilant about it. And we have to mend it, don't end it, is what I would <laughs> like to say in that, uh, to paraphrase some, some other. Uh, but I people. think this gets at the point uh, that of part of why Ripu wrote his book is so that people can have an informed and intelligent debate on all of these subjects. 
We do need energy. We absolutely need energy. And there's a cost associated with inaction also. And I think Ripu alerted, alluded to that in terms of uh, quality of life and options that we're used to, being able to work when we want, where we want, uh, and having even things like clean water and, and good health are all ultimately tied to energy. I mean, so, poverty, you know, is, is the, one of the biggest scourges on Earth. Between 85 and 2005, China lifted 430 million people out of the poverty line. But poverty was defined by existence at less than $2.50 a day by the World Bank. It also means you don't have a car and a refrigerator and a washing it's, machine. We are, talking, we are talking much worse than that situation, right? We are talking. But lifting them that has also required, at the same time, development of a lot of energy, tripling or quadrupling its energy use and all that. But that improved the quality of life of the, you know, millions and millions of people. This is more than the number of people in the United States and Canada and Mexico combined, I think. Does it look like the demand will just keep going up and up no matter what? Because uh, the two most populous countries in the world are China and India. Mm -hmm. And they see how people live in the Western world, and they mm -hmm. want all those energy gobbling appliances. Yeah. Uh, do we have to assume <laughs> that we just have to fill that need, or at some point are we going to say, well, you know, maybe you're not going to get everything you want? We may, we may have to reconsider some of those uh, things, and we have to find ways to use or conserve in a way that allows good things to, have to happen also, but not be profligate in the use. And um, so through, through efficiencies and, and some attitudinal changes are needed. Like if we could have, why is it that there are, that people don't like to live in high density dwellings? High density dwelling is a very efficient way of, do, of saving energy and kind of, but it doesn't, there are certain features about it that people dislike. Can we make, can we design places where it would be desirable people would be attracted to live in and work in those areas. That also, would make a big difference. I also think that there's a process of orderly transition that maybe we haven't fully explored. If you can have policies that indicate the path that you want to be moving forward on, that energy will become more expensive, for example, then people will start, I think, naturally to be looking for improvements in efficiency that, that just didn't make sense unless you thought there was a reason to change your behavior. Yeah. We just have about a minute left. so. Um, let me ask you this. Do you think we're on the right track with energy? I mean, do you think we're, we're getting on top of this problem, or are we in danger of uh, losing our grip over it altogether? I think you have lots of opportunities for more shows on the topic. Yeah. <laughs> right now, I'm afraid we are missing it. And I think there's absolutely what is needed is uh, greater public involvement. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of not a, an immediate response, but a thought, thought out uh, reasoned debate. So you think if the public were better informed, that would be a big help? Yes, yes. We, we, we didn't get to talk more about the nuclear part, but there is a lot more to be said about that also. Okay, well, I'm sure we'll cover this topic again in the future. Okay. We're just a bit out of time, so we're going to have to wrap the show. I'd like to thank my two distinguished guests, Barbara Haydorn and Ripu Daman Malhotra from SRI International. Thank you both for being here today. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you for watching. Uh, be sure to visit our website at www.futuretalk.net and be sure to tune in again next time for Future Talk. This is Marty Wasserman and we'll see you next time.